And then once, once we got, had our first hit with 68 guns back in the UK and the stand over here, I thought, it's time to start the scrapbook again. And, uh, and at that time, um, video cameras became more accessible. And uh, so the first thing, one of the things I did early to, to, to do with the money in from the band was I actually bought a video camera and then started filming everything, filming the gigs and in between the shows and the travel. And, and that's why there's, there's a lot of footage. And um, that I always, I have an archive back in Wales. I have a chapel that I use as a creative hub. It's quite a big space. And um, I was always the person in, in the band that collected the posters on tour, a bit like Bill Wyman was for the Rolling Stones. He was their kind of guy who kept, kept the archive. and. Uh, even even down to songwriting, I'm a, you know I've always read books about other musicians, and uh, I, I read uh, about George Harrison and the Beatles um, when he released the book I Me Mine. Yeah, I Me Mine. Um, it was a collection of all the cigarette packets, handkerchiefs that he'd written lyrics on, napkins, hotel note paper, and, and he used to keep them all in a box, and uh, and that's what I did. And uh, you see them in the film at various times. They cut across the all the old. The yeah, it's like, it's like a filmmaker's delight to have all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good. There's too much. So yeah, it was it was an in instinctive thing on my part was just to, uh, um, and I think it goes back to memory. I've always tried to um, enjoy life to the full and live for the experiences I've, I'm having, and and and, and remember them. I, I was never one. Well, I, I could never drink on the road, you know, I was terrible. But, well, it was, when we started the band, I, I never said a word to anybody. I would go on stage, play our songs, and wouldn't say it. I was so uncommunicative. And then Boy, I thought, a shot. I can't I, believe that. Yeah, it's true. The exact opposite it's true. And, then, and then one night I thought, well, I'll have a few beers. And then maybe if, if it breaks down the inhibition a little bit and I get a bit drunk, I'll start talking to the audience. And yeah, I was drunk on stage. I was great at talking to the audience. <laughs> the only problem was I couldn't sing after I had a beer. So that was the end of that. So I thought I'd rather just, I'll learn how to talk to the audience right, and, good job. and stay off the Other beer. Other questions? Yes, sir. We're just blessed to have you in this world. Yeah. Well, thank and you very much. Glad you're still with us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so I guess this question is sort of from one musician to another. I sort of, you know, starting my band up. So yeah. I'm sort of wondering, you know, what advice do you have, you know, not only as a band and working together, but sort of, you know, working as a team with other people to sort of, you know, create something greater than yourself. You know, it can relate to music or songwriting, but I, I'm wondering if it relates to like your greater organization and greater goals. Well, I think I think whenever you start a band, you've got to be true to yourself, yeah. and um, a, 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 a story that applied to that was very relevant for, for my career when we had our band that you see in the film 17 before it became the alarm uh, we, we kind of felt that if someone came to see us they'd really get the idea and we, and we actually did um, sounds stupid now but we actually went to the offices of the new musical express in London in Carnaby Street and we thought well if we can't get a journalist to come and see us we'll, we'll make one come and we, we actually hatched a plot and tried to kidnap a journalist <laughs> and make him come and it was it was so embarrassing you know we, we, we kind of with this guy come and see us and then right get him lads we were trying to manhandle him into the elevator to get him put him in a van to come I, why we thought we could do it I have no idea <laughs> but it was stupid and then it all got out of hand it got the guy got a bit felt intimidated and ran off and and uh, we felt completely stupid, I did. And, uh, and and there was a journalist from the NME called Roy Card, who wrote one of the famous books about David Bowie. And he, he took us to one side and he goes, look guys, I get what you're trying to do. And he said, uh, you know, if you, uh, you can't force people to come and see your band, but if you focus on your music and make that great, then that will force people to come and see you. So just put all your energy into your music. And if it's meant to be great, it will be. If it's not, if it's meant to be fun, and you play in the garage at the weekends, then that's great too. Don't force the issue. Don't try and be something you're not. You can only be yourself. And if you're true to yourself, that, that creates great music. And uh, there's some brilliant artists who've been recognized after their time. They were not recognized when they were here, but by staying true to yourself, ultimately it will come through. And it, 
might not be tomorrow, might be in a hundred years. But I think if you're going to make music, you have to enjoy it first and foremost and be true to yourself and then wherever it's going to take you, it will lead you there. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So I can see you're still in the army fatigue. Does that mean you're still fighting it? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, I, I have um, an incurable uh, B-cell leukemia. Um, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean to say it's going to get me or get the better of me. No. It might do at times, but um, by staying positive mentally, and the, the jacket is my defense mechanism, yeah. it focuses me mentally, um, then I think everybody has got a fighting chance. My, my disease is very manageable, uh -huh. certainly in the 20 years since I first heard the word, 21 years now since I first heard the word cancer applied to me. Right. Um, by luck, by instinct, by taking a risk here and there. Uh, I've always managed to stay one step ahead of when I might have to stop being who I am and focus on medical treatments that would be more, much more invasive and destructive to the musician and the person you see in front like of you. Would a bone marrow transfer help you? Well, it would, uh -huh. uh, but it might not as well. You know, there's a possibility I could have a bone marrow transplant and not survive. Oh. The, the, the procedure um, it's uh, and so at the moment with my medical team back in Wales they've always decided that, that uh, why treat why make the treatment worse than the disease and so that's always been my doctor Edwards his philosophy uh, when I was re-diagnosed with leukemia from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in, in 2005 uh, I did go to London to see a specialist at the Chelsea Westminster and uh, he had said to me uh, if I want to see my kids in two years I should have a bone marrow transplant wow. right with him right, and come to London and start the week after and uh, I went home with my wife and it was terrifying yeah. and uh, I went to Dr. Edwards and said look this is the advice I've had in London he said it's, it's good advice Mike you know, but I still think it's being too aggressive I, he said, I, I'm not just looking at your blood count on a chart and, 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 where, and where your, you know, your, your white count is or your, your neutrophils. He said, I, I'm, I'm looking at you, the young boy beside you with a guitar in your hand. I come to the gigs, I see you with Jules, your wife. And I, I want to protect that because I don't want to just throw you into a, 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 a treatment that will have you in an isolation booth for, for a year. Uh, that means your fans won't get to see you, can't do any gigs. So, and this, my instinct tells me, and my learning tells me from going to all these conventions, that great things are coming for people with leukemia. He goes, my job is to keep you alive as you are, not give you a treatment that turns you into something else. And, uh, and that's always what he's tried to do. And uh, there came a point, uh, just over a year ago when I, I did have a relapse and my uh, count shot right through the roof again and um, Dr. Edwards put me onto a, a clinical trial but there was a two week period when he considered going for the bone marrow transplant and uh, I wasn't very happy with that. <laughs> I didn't like that at all, I was scared to be honest. Um, but then he called me out of the blue and said, ah, Mike, there's a trial, there's a new drug coming, I've got you on the trial, I'm gonna start tomorrow and, I'm, and so far, the new drugs I have, it's a drug called idololacid. It's been amazing. My count is, uh, is, right, is normal right now. IV I'm in good shape. It's a pill or an IV? Or yeah, it's a, 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 an oral chemotherapy taken yeah, twice a day, and it's incredible. And uh, I think with all these things, as long as you don't develop a resistance to them and then push them back, uh, um, they, they will work for you. I, mean, I, I used to have uh, the drug rituximab, which a lot of people take with leukemia. And uh, Dr. Edwards always said to me, um, he thinks I should have the world record for being on that drug for the longest of anyone he's ever known. Most people tend to push back against that after a few years, but it only started kicking against me last uh, year, about 11 years after I've been on the drug. So I know the symptom as I can see is you're almost impossible to keep up with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, actually, um, I want to hug you. Okay. <laughs> Free hugs, welcome. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to see you. It's a surprise. I think for all of us, like the gentleman said, it's a 
honor and a blessing to have to uh, you are an angel because angel not only from heaven oh. i think you are doing a great great powerful uh, mission and you look like you are 15 or 16. Oh, that's wonderful. Nice. Yeah. Keep, the keep that beautiful energy. <laughs> <laughs> keep that beautiful energy at that wonderful job. Oh, thanks Thank so much. Anybody else? Please. Questions? I have a question about the, um, the age of the bone marrow uh, recipients, or the swab. In England, they went, did I understand it correctly, to be, they could only do it up to age 30, and then you got to extend it to 55? Yeah. That seems like a very. But yeah, what, what, what happens with um, the organizations that do uh, cheek swab or, or bone marrow drives anyway? Um, uh, uh, you can you set your own rules. And um, uh, in the film uh, in Britain, uh, the, the oldest you could be to get on the list was up, up to 45. And that was set by the NHS in Britain. The National Health Service. Um, then there's other organisations like Anthony Nolan Trust, which is an organisation like Beat the Match here in the USA. And uh, when I started um, looking for donors, uh, I did partner with the Anthony Nolan Trust at first, and and they wouldn't do cheek swaps like we do here in America. They would they used to do a thing called a spit test. So we'd go to a gig, and we'd ask ask people to not have a drink. If they come up to the booth, they say, have you had a beer? And they say, yeah, I've had a beer, one beer. And say, well, do you not have a drink for two hours and come back? Now, that's not going to work with the rock and roll beer. And, uh, and, and um, so I, I started to uh, um, speak to the government because there was all these different factors. You, it was 45 for the NHS, but even in the NHS, if you, were, you could only be a bone marrow donor if you were a registered blood donor first. So some people who'd had, say, uh, certain illnesses um, would, would not, they could be, they couldn't be blood donors, but they could, they could be bone marrow donors, but because they can't be blood donors, they couldn't get onto the bone marrow list. It was all these rules and regulations different. And uh, the age thing comes from uh, some people who, are, who need a, a donor are lucky enough to have a choice, and they might have four donors to choose from. And the, the team that's going to do the transplant will always choose the youngest person of the four. And that's because the, the youngest person has the, the, the immune system that's been less exposed to common flus and you know, other diseases. So it skews the numbers towards the, the feeling that young people are the best donors. And they are, but they're not the only donors. So um, again, we try to... Uh, James and I started to speak at uh, cancer conventions at the World Congress in Parliament. We say what we, we need is a regulation across the world that says this is how you get on the list and this is the age and the parameters. And uh, we think the American model is the best. It's between 18 and 55. Um, it's the same in Germany. And we're able to do it here in America through Love Hope Strength because we partner with BKMS from Germany, who are the biggest. Uh, provider of donors in the world. They're very organized in Germany. So we all you know how well organized they are. Mike, can you tell us a little more about James' story? Because that yeah, was a great thing that wasn't right. touched on as much as it should have been. Um, what what uh, engaged James Chippendale and I that started Love Up Strength uh, to uh, come into being was that um, when I was very ill and, and wanted to play a gig in Texas, um, I didn't have, I couldn't qualify for any insurance for, to travel. So my wife spoke to some friends who introduced us to James Chippendale by email and uh, we shared our stories and James said look if something happens to you I'll, I'll get you looked after and when we arrived at the airport and we were talking about our stories um, James told me how his life had been saved by um, he was at uh, he was he had acute myeloid leukemia and he was at a point where um, the doctors were going to give him a treatment that would have given him another three months of life but he would never have survived the transplant after he took that treatment. And four days before that, that day arrived, they check, did one last check on the registry, having checked for years and no one had come forward. And then bang, there was a match for James Chippendale. It was a gentleman called Klaus who you saw in the film. 
he was 42 years of old, uh, old when he signed on to the registry. And immediately he was brought in and he gave his blood and it was shipped to America and given to James and James grew a clone of his immune system and is alive today. And uh, when James told me that story, I, I, and, he, and he said, obviously, I'm a very lucky man to be alive. I said, you're more lucky than you realize because if Klaus had been born in Britain, he would not have got on the list. They would have turned him away. So um, that compelled us to get, step forward and, and try and make the change. And we were able to make the change in Britain, not really through uh, parliamentary campaigns. We did it because we persuaded DKMS to set up in Britain and, and, and work themselves into the British health system and then we helped them in Westminster and uh, and the, we, we got to uh, go to Westminster to do the donor drive to show our partnership meant that in Britain we could be an alternative to the NHS or Anthony Nolan and we could then offer people a chance to sign on the list up to 55 and it's my, it's my always thinking that a lot of people get on the list because they're looking for a match in their family so they hold a family donor drive and they appeal to their workmates and the community. And uh, especially if you're looking for a young a donor for a young child. And, and if the age stays at, at 30 and under that, that uncle who's 35, who could well be the match, isn't going to get on the list. But with the age up to 55, most active family members can get on the list through a family drive and that can make a real, a tangible difference for the, the livelihood of the, the loved one they're trying to save. And the process is super simple. You go out there right after, swab your cheek, sign, you know, a couple, two minutes, and you're on the list. So, 1855, everybody should sign up. It's not often you get to go to an event these days when you're all actually young enough to do something. <laughs> yeah, I realized that I did it in Dallas at the film fest where we debuted the film last week, and I was like, wow, if I waited until November 4th, I was done. So, thank God for that. Yeah, we, we, uh, we'll take one uh, or two more questions. Yes, sir. Can you tell us what music has meant to your life to you before your diagnosis and after your diagnosis? Well, um, you know, music changed my life. You know, um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a soccer player and play for Manchester United, but I soon realized I wasn't going to be good, good enough for that. But I, I saw the Sex Pistols in 1976, and I thought, if they can do it, so can I. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I've always followed that, that path ever since. And, um, and, and uh, I, I'm still a massive fan of music, even though I play music and I, it's my livelihood and I'm still a fan, I still buy records and, you know, I was doing an in-store at uh, Fingerprints Records in Long Beach on Saturday, but I still buy my David Bowie records to take home to play and, um, and, and it sustained me through everything. When, when I had my first uh, real day of treatment with uh, leukaemia in, in 2005, I, I was, uh, I took my iPod to listen while I was being treated and uh, I found myself slipping away, you know, I was having a, it was a very intense time and I had a wooden box at the end of the bed that was trying to keep me upright and needles coming up my arms and taking blood out here and putting it back in here and it was pretty intense and I was in a bit of shock and uh, my wife put my ear plugs in and so I could listen to some music and uh, I heard the song by Big Country, In a Big Country, yeah. Stay Alive. Uh, Dream stay with you, stay alive. It sings, and uh, and I heard the stay alive. And thought, get back to con get back in the, get back in the ring, Peter. You know, you got to fight for this, and uh, and that's that's what I've, I've been doing. So music keeps me alive, and you know I'm lucky enough to have um, been blessed to write some words that have made the communication with others. Who, you know, some people have come up to me and said, oh, that song you wrote in 1985 that saved me and kept me going, and. They're the greatest gifts you get back from the world as a musician. It's not the box office sales or the hits or the gold records. It's when someone writes to you a letter and says your music's made a difference in their life. That's the, the real mark of success. Yes, last question. Uh, excellent movie, by the way. Um, keep the fight. Uh, I was going to say, um, what are you doing to grow the movie, to get more people to watch it? Excellent question, my friend. Way to tee that up. Um, <laughs> the, movie, the movie is going to be released by Accelerator Media on J July 4th. And um, Mike, is we booked Mike on the Warp Tour, believe it or not, with all the youngins. And Mike will get out there with the alarm and do a 35-minute punk rock set on the Warp Tour, which will kick off July 7th. And then we tour across the country, uh, 40 dates all told, from Jan July 6th through the end of August. 
Um, yeah. And he will, we will try to do screenings like this all across the country. So the key is, you know, the more money that gets donated to the charity, the more money we have to buy theaters and to do events like this. Because to me, the first screening we did in Dallas the other night, I was like, wow, this is it. Like, we have to. Mike came, flew across the country, uh, world to get here and performed in Dallas. Actually had a flat tire at 4 o'clock in the morning and missed his flight, but still made it in time. He had to change the flat in the middle of the night, 5 a.m., on the side of the road to get to LAX. Got the next flight, and this is when I realized this guy was such a gamer that we we're going to get along very well. Um, but so show we're going to go on. Yeah, the show must go on. So we're going to continually move the movie around the country. John Goodman, raise your hand. Doing all our social media. So please post, you know, to your friends. It really does make a difference. Like the word has to be spread one person at a time, and uh, that's the same thing we get on the list. This movie is, you know, the greatest thing for this charity and, and Mike's mission. Um, that we'll, you'll ever have. So it really is incumbent on everybody to just help spread the word about this film. And another thing that, that uh, we're looking to be part of with our Get On The List campaign, which uh, we are hosting outside the theatre doors there. If you want to get on the list, the booth is there. It takes a few minutes. Um, we, we work with all sorts of artists. You know, we, we'll be out on tour this summer with Linkin Park. We work with Kenny Chesney. So we go right across the board. We work with the younger bands like Flogging Molly, or we're going to be, uh, I say, we're on the Vans Walk Tour, but we're also at Austin City Limits, Lollapalooza, all, all kinds of festivals. We work with Andrew McMahon in the wilderness. Uh, so we, uh, the message gets out there through our booth, and, and every time we work a concert with another band, say Linkin Park, for instance, we've, we've done quite a few shows with them, uh, and by being at their shows, we've we managed to save 45 lives. Uh, through their fans getting on the list, and and it's Linkin Park that get the credit for the lives saved. You know, we worked with uh, Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin. We found three life saving matches at his concerts, or Frank Turner, who's a younger artist at the other end of the scale. We, I think we found over fifty matches at his gig. So uh, it, wherever we go, there's an opportunity to spread the word about the film because it, this it, it's not really about the film. It's about saving lives. So this film, wherever it plays, has the opportunity to save lives. And there's not many art forms, media presentations that have that opportunity, but Man in the Camera Jacket does. So hopefully it will make an impact wherever it plays. So again, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Peters. Thank you. Thank you. you want song, man? Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Go on. All right. All right. Any requests? Oh, oh, that's a rare one. <laughs> oh, it's, I tell you what, it's okay. Let me, let me, I'll play you. Uh, there we go. Let's see, so when you're on the mountain, you haven't got any of this. So I think we can play without, and I'll move around. Sure. This is how when we, when we go up on the mountains, and uh, we've done a few. And uh, we've got, we're already planning a uh, big adventure for the summer, um, which is going to take us all through the canyons of North America, Grand Canyon, Rice Canyon, Simon Canyon, and taking uh, musicians and supporters, singing wherever we go. It's all with acoustic guitars and raise our voices loud.
coming out tonight to see the film. And uh, I, I, I'll sing you a song. Like, this is literally how we, we, a song we wrote to sing in the mountains. Uh, we were going to uh, our trek on Everest back in 2007. And um, we needed a theme song to sing on the mountain. And when, when you go to sing at altitude, uh, why we take so many musicians is that when you get the altitude, you can't hold your breath long enough to sing a complete song. Unless you're a Sherpa, of course. And uh, so I needed to take Cy Kern in from The Fix of Me, because he could sing. Len Tilbrook from Squeeze, because he could sing. Slim Jim Phantom from The Stray Cats, because he could play drums and he could sing. <laughs> because he's like, he was like the Fonz on the... You know, we, you know you, you've seen you know the Fonz, right? Yeah. Well, we all trained. We all got off the plane, and, and we've all done all kinds of training to climb Everest. And Slim Jim gets off the plane, and he goes... Right, guys. <laughs> Which way's the mountain, you know? And we go, have you, have you done any training? He went, I walked the dog in the Hollywood Hills. <laughs> How hard can it be? I'm thinking, he's in for a shock. Yeah. So anyway, we head off into the mountains, and I'm like going, <sighs> climbing up to this first peak. Slim Jim's waiting at the top. Where have you been, Peter? <laughs> and we, and we, we, we go, we're at like something like 16,000 feet and all our mobile phones and communications are all cut off now. The only way is global satellite communication. And uh, I come out, we're in the Gorak Chef and I come out on the, into the, into, uh, outside the tents and where we were staying. And yeah, just trying to get their loved ones on the phone and the, the, the satellite phone has, has only got a few seconds to get out to, to beam our podcast and for nine, Slim Jim's on his phone. Right, darling, how's it going? <laughs> only the Fonz is mobile phone would work at altitude and Slim Jim Phantom had that. We, that's why he was on the trek because he brought the spirit of the Fonz with us. But everyone brought something to c contribute, but mainly uh, it was voices so that when you sing... A couple of lines, and you were about to gasp. Rest, you could look over at Glenn Tilbrook, and he'd take over. And uh, and it, it was it's amazing how music um, energized us all on the mountain because uh, we we were climbing up to uh, the um, uh, Kalapatar was the peak we'd we'd identified that if we got to the summit of that eighteen and a half thousand feet and played a gig, it'd be the world's highest gig, as you can see in the film. And uh, just before we set off to do that last climb, and uh, we have Jake Norton with his great mountain uh, summit here. He summited Everest three times. He was there when they, f they found the mythical body of George Mallory on the mountain. And uh, he told some amazing stories. And he, he, he really gave us a great speech to send us up to the mountain. But Glenn Tilbert was so ill climbing Everest because he, he'd been sneakily drinking his whiskey in the mountain, which he wasn't supposed to be doing. But he liked the whiskey, so he did. So God bless Glenn. So anyway, we're climbing up Calabatar, and we, we he take five feet like this. He's like, oh, he'd be sick. <laughs> and then you go, another five feet, he'd be sick. Oh, I've got to sit down. He'd be sick again, he'd stand up, and it, it took him an hour to get from here to the far end of the cinema. <laughs> and then I said, right, Glenn, we've got to do the gig. Go, oh, I'm so ill. I said, here's your guitar, Glenn. He goes, okay, and he goes... <laughs> Chuck Berry and across the mountainside on Everest. He's the first person in history to do, do the Chuck Berry duck walk <laughs> in the highest place you could possibly get to. And uh, this is a song that we recorded uh, in, uh, in Kathmandu before we set off on the mountain. And it gives its name to our charity, just like Spank did. Dreams to the end of 
can see on the road somewhere. We're back down here in Orange County, very well. Thanks to Jonathan here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you guys all for coming, spread the word, and go out and swab. Yeah, get on the list, save a life Thank tonight. You Brilliant. Thank you.